بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Shall I continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Masirat Nabawiya In the previous session we talked about we actually concluded our discussion uh, after I believe three or four sessions on the migration to Abyssinia the Hijra to Habasha uh, that took place uh, in the towards the end of the fourth year in the early part of the fifth year of Nubuwa of prophethood um, and towards the tail end of that what we talked about was Im- the migration to Abyssinia was immediately almost very soon uh, some of the some of the scholars of Sira put it at maybe as soon as a couple of weeks afterwards uh, after the second migration which was the more mass migration the major migration after that point Hamza radiyallahu anhu Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted Islam and according to the more authentic um, and more accepted uh, accounts of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, three days after Hamza radiallahu anhu accepted Islam, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. And in the previous session, we at least talked about the pre-shahada phase of Umar radiallahu anhu. We talked about him personally, who he was, where he came from, what his personality was like, how he grew up, what were some of his experiences growing up. But then we also talked a little bit about a couple of very interesting experiences that he had, that even if they weren't enough to take him to, the, to, to get him over the hump, in terms of accepting Islam, it at least took him to the very brink of accepting Islam. A couple of experiences that he had had. And then there was the third and the final major event in his life, which was the event that finally pushed it over the hump and he was able to accept Islam after that. And this is um, narrated by... There, there, there's something else very... Um, we'll, we'll come back and talk about this rather. So this is narrated by... Um, a few of different Sahaba radiallahu anhum who relate this account from a couple of different perspectives. One of them is of course uh, the individual himself, uh, Nu'aym bin Abdullah. Um, other accounts of this are related by other younger Sahaba who were able to hear then collect the full account from the different people who were involved in the situation. But this is a very well-known uh, account and story that is mentioned in the majority of the books of Sirah. And it mentions that uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was of course he had the reputation that he had and we've talked about this previously. But it talks about how one time he went to uh, the Kaaba, he went to the Baytullah, the Haram, and while he was there he heard some people talking about the constant issues that they were having, that they were experiencing in regards to the Prophet ﷺ. That's why some of the books of Sirah actually mentioned that Al-Walid, uh, Al-Walid bin Mughira, when he went and made that offer to the Prophet ﷺ, that will make you the wealthiest amongst us, will make you the most powerful amongst us, that this was before the conversion of Umar radiallahu anhu. And what that would basically mean is that they had explored many different avenues and were not able to finally solve this problem um, that they were at least experiencing. So they were having a conversation or a discussion about this. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, I'll take care of things. I'll take care of it. What's the big deal? And so it mentions that he took his sword. And while carrying a sword was not completely out of character for people at that time, but what was a sign of somebody setting out with an intention to, uh, with an intention of violence, was that that person would not have their sword tied to their side, rather that person would hold their sword in their hand. So kind of even a police officer carries a gun all the time. But when they take the gun out of the holster, that shows the intent to take some action. So similarly, Umar radiallahu anhu actually unstrapped, unsheathed his sword from his side, and held it in his hand as a statement and said, I'll go take care of things. And so it says that he basically set out and he seemed like he was a man on a mission. He seemed very intent, very serious to basically go and take care of things. And along the way he ran into Nu'aym bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu, who was a sahabi, who was a companion of the Prophet he was one of those early Muslims. And he saw him and he saw that Umar radiallahu anhu had his sword in his hand. So he asked him, Aina turidu ya Umar? He said, what, where, what are you intending to do? Where, where do you want to go, Umar? 
So he said, "Urid Muhammadan." He said, "I'm going to look for Muhammad." هذا الصابي الذي فرق أمر قريش وسفها أحلامنا وعاب ديننا وسب آلهتنا فأقتله. He said, "I'm going to find this Muhammad, this uh, man who has abandoned this heretic." This man who has abandoned uh, his religion, he has divided up all the, you know, the, the energies of the Quraysh. He has made some of our most intelligent people make fools out of themselves. He has um, tainted our religion. He has cursed our, our gods and deities. So I'm going to go and kill him. I'm going to finish him off. So Nu'aym radiallahu anhu said to him, because you also have to understand, Nu'aym radiallahu anhu is not trying to cause any more problems for anyone, but you have to understand that moment. This is Umar, he has a certain reputation that he carries, he seems like he's very upset and angry, he has a sword in his hand, and he seems very intense, hell-bent on harming the Prophet wasallam. So Nu'aym radiallahu anhu becomes very emotional, and very defensive, and very worried. So he says, وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ غَرَّتْكَ نَفْسُكَ مِن نَفْسِكَ يَا عُمَرْ he says, you, you, you are extremely deluded. You are, you are deluding yourself, O oh, Umar. He said, أَتَرَى بَنِي عَبْدِ مُنَافِ تَارِكِيكَ تَمْشِي عَلَى الْأَرْضِ وَقَدْ قَتَلْتَ مُحَمَّدًا He said, do you really think that Banu Abd Munaf, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, will let you walk around freely after you have killed and murdered Muhammad ﷺ, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, a man from the family of leadership in their family? You think they're going to tolerate that? And he saw that Umar radiallahu anhu really wasn't phased by this idea. He didn't just seem to care. He said, you really think they're gonna let you walk around, they won't kill you in retribution? He saw Umar radiallahu anhu didn't even bat an eye. So now Nu'aym radiallahu anhu realizes he has to up his game a little bit. He has to try a different strategy. So he says, أَفَلَا تَرْجَعَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ فَتُقِيمَ أَمْرَهُمْ he said, then he goes to the next step. So you have to understand, Nu'aym radiallahu anhu is very desperate. And you know, desperate times calls for, call for desperate measures. So Nu'aym radiallahu anhu says that, why don't you go back home and fix things at home? You're out solving other people's problems, trying to put other people in line. Why don't you put your own family in line first? Now Umar radiallahu anhu, this was news to him. He said, wa ayyu ahli bayti. So who are you talking about? What are you talking about? So he kind of calls him on his bluff. He calls him on his bluff. He goes, what are you talking about? My family. What do you mean I need to fix my family? So he says, خَتَنُكَ وَابْنُ عَمِّكَ سَعِيدٍ بِنْ زَيْدٍ وَأُخْتُكَ فَاطِمَةٍ He says that your brother-in-law, who's also your cousin, and your sister, who's married to this cousin of yours, your sister Fatima and her husband Sa'id bin Zayd. Sa'id bin Zayd, who's from the Ashara Mubashara as well. And then he says, فَقَدْ وَاللَّهِ أَسْلَمَا وَتَابَعَ مُحَمَّدًا عَلَى دِينِهِ فَعَلَيْكَ بِهِمَا So he goes that both of them have accepted Islam and both of them follow Muhammad wasallam upon the religion that Muhammad has brought. And so you want to deal with somebody, go deal with them. So Umar radiallahu anhu immediately changes route. And he heads over to his sister's home. And the narration mentions that when he reaches the door, from outside of the door, because you have to understand the homes at that time, from outside of the door, what he hears is that he hears three voices reciting Qur'an. That his sister Fatima and her husband, Sa'id bin Zayd, were having a Qur'an class with their Qur'an teacher, their Qur'an tutor, Khabbab bin al-Arat, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the story of the conversion of Umar radiallahu anhu is a, a profound story at many different levels. There's obviously the importance of Qur'anic education, and just the realization and the power of the kalam of Allah, which we're going to see when Umar radiallahu anhu reads the Qur'an for himself. But another wrinkle, another lesson, another moral of this story is the importance of Qur'anic education at home. The importance of Qur'anic education at home. The importance of halaqat of the Qur'an going on at home. The importance of the recitation of the Qur'an at home. This is very, very important. There needs to be a small Qur'an halaqah in each and every single home. Now it's understandable that maybe, there's two things here that I gotta say. Number one, it's understandable that parents might feel that you know maybe they're not qualified to have any type of uh, Qur'an class at home. 
So it's understandable, but that still doesn't excuse us from the fact that at some level there needs to be a Qur'an halaqa at home. So fine, the parents might not be able to do tafsir of the Qur'an at home for their children. That's understandable. But at the very least, they can at least sit and recite Qur'an together. There can at least be 15 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, dedicated to just reciting the Qur'an together as a family. And this is very, very important. This is necessary. But the second thing I have to say about that is, at the same time, a lot of, uh, we, oftentimes I have parents coming to me making that excuse. Well, I don't know, or I can don't even, I can't even sit and recite Quran at home with at home with my children because I have bad tajweed. I don't want to ruin their recitation. That's why I send them to the masjid, the Quran class at the masjid, the Quran school at the masjid. But what I have to say to that is that. It's not a good enough of an excuse. We, we take this excuse and we basically live off the rest of our lives based off of this excuse. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have knowledge. I don't know what to teach them. I can't even read it with them. I don't want to ruin their tajweed, ruin their pronunciation. How about instead of not teaching our kids Qur'an at home, instead of not reciting Qur'an with our kids at home, instead of that, why don't we just take out a few days, dedicate the next couple of weeks to learning something. So that we do become qualified to teach our own children. Parents must be the first teachers of their children. Homes must be the first madaris, the first madrasa, the first Islamic school that our kids attend. And the excuse that I don't know is not good enough for me as a father. Fine, I don't know. That's very good that at least I understand what my deficiencies are. But it's about time that I started working on those deficiencies. I did learn, I did educate myself. And you know what, very honestly, again, I'm not talking about some high level scholarly tafsir of the Qur'an, but I'm talking about basics. Basics such as just reciting Qur'an with tajweed. Or maybe even just knowing the basic translation, tarjuma of a small surah, and being able to just kind of, in your own language, how you sit and you, you're not a mathematician, you're not a math professor, but you sit down and help your kid with their school homework, don't you? You're not a professor of English literature, but you helped them write their book report. So at the very least, you can sit down and at least talk about something. Talk about something with your children. But it, it, and it doesn't take a whole lot to learn at that level. It really does not. I mean, one reference that I have, and this is not meant to be a plug, but one, referen- one, one reference in my mind that I have, is that if it's tajweed, is the problem. A good friend and a student of mine, Hafid Wissam, he teaches a tajweed course, it's one weekend. Only reason why I mention this, don't worry, it's not coming here, I'm not advertising a course. I'm just giving you a reference. He probably spends about 15 hours with, with the students during that weekend. No, they don't become masters of tajweed. No, they don't get an ijazah in tajweed. But what they do learn, is they learn the very basics. In 15 hours, they learn the very basics. To at least start reading in the right direction. We can't make one weekend. We can't start putting in 15-20 minutes a day, sitting with the imam, sitting with the hafiz, playing a YouTube video. Again, hafiz Wissam, I know he's recorded the entire 30th juz, where he basically walks you through reciting each surah in the 30th juz. And so, uh, at the very least, if I can't invest 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day over the next couple of weeks, so that I am capable of you know, leading some type of Qur'anic reading and education within my home is very important. So we see here the blessings of each and every single home becoming a halaqa, becoming a madrasa of the Qur'an at a very basic level. Then fine, when my kids need to learn something more, they want to learn tafsir, they'll come here to Imam Ziyah's halaqa for tafsir. That's understandable. But at the very least, I can get the balls rolling. I can get things started at home. And I must, I need to. And that's basically what was going on here. This was, so why would some of the earliest of Muslims, especially those, some, some of these early Muslims who were very close to the Prophet ﷺ, where do you think they learned how to have a Qur'an halaqa at home? It was from the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. So it was part of the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ that as people were accepting Islam, to turn each and every single home into a basic, elementary level, kindergarten of the Qur'an. It was like every, every single home was turning into a preschool for Qur'an, at the very least, to nourish the souls, 
to develop the spirituality of the people, to strengthen people in their iman, in their relationship with Allah. And that's what was going on here. So Umar radiallahu anhu approaches outside the door and he can hear them reciting Qur'an together. He knocks on the door. The narration says that they look out, they peek out from the door and they see it's Umar radiallahu anhu. Some of the narrations say that when he knocks on the door, he's actually screaming and yelling and screaming, open up, open up. I can hear you, I know you're in there. Because he's so angry and upset. And Khabab bin al-Arat radiallahu anhu, when he hears Umar radiallahu anhu outside screaming, he hides. He runs and hides. They hide him, they stash him somewhere in the home. And they open the door and the pages of the Qur'an are still out. He busts through the door and immediately pounces his brother-in-law and says, I heard somebody else. Who was the, who is the third person with you? And they say, we swear, swear, there was nobody else. And he says, have you, left this, have you left our religion? Have you followed this man Muhammad? And he starts beating his brother-in-law. Severely, he's in a, in, a, in a rage. All he sees is red. He's beating his brother-in-law. His sister comes and tries to grab him and pull him off of her husband. And he swings back and ends up striking his sister. And the narration actually mentions that she's bleeding. When he looks around, and, and then that's when she finally says to him, she says to him that she says, Yes, Umar, you want to know? You want the answer? You want the answer? Yes, we have believed in Muhammad. We have accepted his deen. We have rejected these idols. We do follow the deen of Muhammad. What are you going to do about it? You want to kill us? Go ahead and kill us. Do what you have to do. Do your worst. And at that time, Umar radiallahu anhu looks at his sister, sees her bleeding, and he kind of calms down a little bit, realizes what he's done realizes what a, what, a, what a rage he was in, and he calms down. And when he finally calms down, regains a little bit of his composure, then he sees the pages lying there, and he goes, what's that? And begins to move towards it. His sister goes and grabs the pages, snatches them up, holds the pages to herself, and she says, no, you can't touch this. I will not let you put your hands on this. And he clarifies his intention to his sister. My intention is not to rip them or disrespect them. I want to read them. I might as well. My own sister is also gotten caught up in all this nonsense. I might as well find out what this is about. So she says, no, you're not clean. You're not pure. Because Umar radiallahu anhu in another narration, he talks about, in another account of him accepting Islam, he actually mentions that how you know, how he used to remain drunk most of the time. So she said, no, you're probably, you probably have alcohol on you and things like that. No. So she makes him clean up. After he cleans up, then she hands him the pages. And the narration tells us that Umar radiallahu anhu begins to read, and it's surah number 20, surah Taha. And he begins to read from the beginning of surah Taha. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an litashqa. That we have not sent down this Qur'an upon you to ruin your life. إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Rather, this is a powerful reminder for the person who will heed the reminder. Who, who, is, who is overwhelmed by the greatness of Allah. إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى تَنْزِيلًا مِمَّنْ خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ الْعُلَى This is being sent down little by little by the one who created from the one who created the earth and the one who created the heavens most high, the sky most high. That who is this one who created this? Ar-Rahman, the abundantly merciful, who positioned himself above the arsh, above the throne. الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى to him alone belongs all that which is in the heavens all that which is in the earth and all that which is between the two and all that which is underneath the surface of the earth and the ground that we see وإن تجهر بالقول فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى and even if you were to speak up out loud then that's fine that's optional for you why فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى 
akhfa because he knows that which is secret and he knows even that which is even more quiet than that which is secret meaning he hears and he knows that which you whisper and he even knows those things that you don't even utter that remain hidden deep buried within your heart allah la ilaha illa hu lahu al asma ul husna who is this this is allah there is no one worthy of worship but him for him alone are the most excellent and beautiful names wa hal ataka hadith musa some of the narrations say that he only read up here to ayah number 8 some of the narrations say no he read even past this wa hal ataka hadith musa has the really fascinating story of musa ever reached you have you ever heard the story id ra'a naran fa qala li ahlihi umkuthu inni anastu naran la'alli atikum minha bi qabasin aw ajidu 'ala an-nar huda When he saw a fire in the distance and he told his family y'all stay here I'm going uh, it's as if I can spot a fire far away in the distance I'm going to go there and hopefully I'll be able to come back to you from there with some of the fire or maybe I'll find some directions maybe somebody there will be able to guide me will be able to help us out فَلَمَّا أَتَاهَا نُودِيَ يَا مُوسَى When he finally reached the fire, then he was called out to, O oh Musa, إِنِّي أَنَ رَبُّكَ فَخْلَا عَنَا عَلَيْكَ Most definitely, I am your Lord and your Master, so take off your shoes. إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ تُوَى Most definitely, you are at the very sacred valley of Tuwa. You are standing in a very sacred place. وَأَنَ اخْتَرْتُكَ فَاسْتَمِعْ لِمَا يُحَى And I have chosen you, O Musa. So listen very carefully to what is about to be sent down. Innani an Allah. Innani an Allah. And the second narration says that he read up to here. Ayah number 14. Innani an Allah. Most definitely me, I am Allah. There's a very interesting nuance in the ayah here. Allah refers to Himself, speaks about Himself three times in this ayah. And each time, I want you to see the progression. In the knee, knee is what we call an attached pronoun. Then Allah refers to Himself with Anna, which we call an independent pronoun, which is a more powerful, uh, which is more powerful in its in its uh, emphasis than an attached pronoun. And then He refers to Himself as Allah, which is His name, which is more powerful than an independent pronoun. So you see the progression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is basically the mufassirun they explain to us what we witness from going from an in, attached to an independent to the name of of Allah the actual name of Allah what we witness here is the development of Musa alayhi salam's iman within that conversation Musa alayhi salam's iman is completed and it shows that journey how a person grows in the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when when umar radiyallahu anhu read these words at the culmination of his re- recitation innani ana allah when he read this la ilaha illa ana there are there is no one worthy of worship of uh, worthy of worship except for me fa'budni so enslave yourself to me worship me wa aqimis salata li dhikri and establish a prayer to remember me to remember me when umar radiyallahu anhu read this ayah and went through that journey of recognizing allah umar radiyallahu anhu put the pages down and looked at his sister and said i need you to take me to muhammad immediately i need you to take me to muhammad immediately i have to go now now his sister of course still weary of Umar radiyallahu anhu she says what's your intention what do you intend to do and he says wallahi i intend no harm i only want to go there so i can accept islam and as he says this khabab radiyallahu anhu comes out of hiding he comes out from where he was hiding and he says congratulations ya umar abshir ya umar He says just last night I was with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he made dua. That oh Allah, Allahumma ayyid al-Islam. Oh Allah, aid the religion of Islam bi Abi al-Hakam bin Hisham, bi Amr bin Hisham, either aid the religion of Islam through the through uh, Abu Jahal or bi Umar ibn al-Khattab. or through Umar bin Umar the son of Khattab 
So just last night the Prophet ﷺ made dua. That, oh Allah, aid the religion of Islam, either through the conversion of Abu Jahl or the conversion of Umar bin Khattab. And it seems like the Prophet ﷺ's dua was accepted for you, Ya Umar. It was accepted for you. And so now they go about their, they, they head out basically. And Umar radiallahu anhu takes his sword now and the narration says that he ties it to his side. He sheathes the sword and he ties it. Basically he straps you know, his weapon back in. But nevertheless, Umar radiallahu anhu carrying a weapon in and of itself is enough cause for concern. Even though he holstered it, it's still a little discerning. And so they head out and they reach the house of Arqam, Darul Arqam. They reach there, which was not too far from the Haram, the Kaaba. And Umar radiallahu anhu knocks on the door. When he knocks on the door, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and it says that the narration mentions that that must have been a time for, you know, some prayer or some learning with the Prophet sallallahu that quite a few Sahaba were there in the house of Arqam at that time. So it seems like it was a time for a halaqa or a class or a salah or something. That there were a lot of people who were there. So one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum got up and went and looked outside. And when he peeked through the door, he saw Umar radiallahu anhu standing out there, which was enough, troubling enough. And then he saw that he had his sword tied to his side. So he runs back in and he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, Umar is outside and he has a sword with him. So Hamza radiallahu anhu, immediately the sahaba are very nervous and worried. The Prophet calms everyone down. Hamza radiallahu anhu just accepted Islam a couple of days ago. And if you remember when we talked about it, Hamza radiallahu anhu had gone through his own little journey. He came and proclaimed his faith and then spent the whole night in turmoil, comes to the Prophet ﷺ the next day, makes dua to Allah before coming to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Oh Allah, guide me to that which is the best for me. I don't understand what's going on. Things are moving too fast. And when he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he just opens up and he goes, Look, we're, we're, we're family. We're family, so I'm just gonna level with you. I'm conflicted. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Let me tell you something about this religion. And Hamza radiallahu anhu says, I swear that's what I've been waiting for you to do. And the Prophet sallallahu recites some Qur'an to Hamza radiallahu anhu. And by the time the Prophet sallallahu is done with the recitation, Hamza radiallahu anhu says, I'm good, I'm convinced. So Hamza radiallahu anhu, even though it's been three days, he's kind of gone through his own little journey and reflective process. And it said that those, those first three days that Hamza radiallahu anhu was Muslim, he did not leave the house of Arqam. He literally was just camped out there. Morning and evening, day and night, was just spending, just like, consider almost i'tikaf. He was doing i'tikaf for three days with the Prophet ﷺ. So by this time, he's fully empowered in his iman and his faith. Hamza radiallahu anhu stands up and says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, O Messenger of Allah, let him in. If he's come with khair, in ja'a yuridu khairan, if he's come with khair, then we will do whatever it is that we have to do in order to make sure that he receives that khair. We'll take care of him. But in ja'a yuridu sharran, but if he's come seeking something bad, then let him come, wa aqutuluhu bisayfihi. And I will kill him with his sword. If he's come here to do harm to you, O Messenger of Allah, I will take his sword, I will disarm him, and then I will kill him with his own sword. So let him come. So the Prophet ﷺ stands up and says, open the door. Umar radiallahu anhu very quietly, very calmly walks in the door. And the narration says, and this is very interesting, you have to understand the balance in the personality of the Prophet ﷺ. He was very welcoming. He was very embracing. But at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ was also a man of confidence. And the Prophet ﷺ's greatest quality was that something he advised us to do. أَنزِلِ النَّاسَ مَنَازِ لَهُمْ وَكَلِّمِ النَّاسَ قَدْرُ عُقُولِهِمْ Deal with people according to their level and speak to people according to their level of intelligence. Understand different people and deal with different people differently. Not, it's not one size fits all. 
And so the Prophet ﷺ understanding Umar radiallahu anhu and also understanding the condition and the emotional state of the people who were there around him, the Prophet ﷺ narration says, he moved forward, he walked forward very quickly. Like what we would call he stepped up on Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu literally walked in the door, just stepped into the door very calmly. And you know when somebody rushes up to you and kind of gets up in your face? The Prophet ﷺ walked up to Umar radiallahu anhu, got in his face, and the narration says he grabbed him from here, and then he said, what do you want, Umar? What do you want? What are you here for? And the Prophet ﷺ even told him, he says, Umar, you will not stop making trouble until the punishment of Allah finally comes down upon you. Because Umar radiallahu anhu had a reputation. And see, you also have to understand, this is not unnecessary. It's not like the Prophet is just picking on some poor guy for no reason. Then there are other narrations, I've talked about them as well, that clearly talk about the fact that Umar radiallahu anhu was the torturer of many of the early Muslims. Some of the narrations that I mentioned earlier when I talked about some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu undergoing torture and abuse, that Umar radiallahu anhu, many of them had suffered torture at the hands of Umar radiallahu anhu. And again, I mentioned this in the previous session, Umar radiallahu anhu is the nephew. His mother's brother is Abu Jahl. So he was taught and mentored by his uncle Abu Jahl. So he was by the side of Abu Jahl oftentimes when Abu Jahl was engaging in torture. So the Prophet ﷺ is dealing with him very appropriately. So he walks up to him and he says, Umar, you will not stop making trouble until finally the, the wrath of Allah comes down on you. What's wrong with you? You're here to make trouble again? And Umar radiallahu anhu, very softly, very gently, because he's gone through this transformative experience. He says, O Messenger of Allah, I do not come here with any such intention. I come here to accept Islam. And the narration says that when Umar radiallahu anhu says this to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ yells out, Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! He says the takbir. And one of the narrations even mentions that the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu scream, Allahu Akbar! along with the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ sits him down and gives him his shahada. And Umar radiallahu anhu accepts Islam at that point. And this is the story of how Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu came to Islam. But the story doesn't end there. It actually goes on to mention that Umar radiallahu anhu after this, he, one of one the narrations mentions that he goes to Abu Jahl's home. And he knocks on Abu Jahl's door, his uncle, the head of the family. He knocks on his door. Abu Jahl of course sees, it's his nephew who he looked at with quite some hope as maybe a successor, somebody who was grooming and mentoring to take over his position in the city. He sees him, so he welcomes him in. You know how you kind of welcome in? Like your, your, your protege, your assistant, your second in command. Oh, it's you. come on in, come on in. Don't worry about it, just come on in. He welcomes him in. Umar radiallahu anhu, knowing better, basically says, no, no, I came here to tell you that I've accepted Islam. I follow Muhammad ﷺ now. And Abu Jahl is so disgusted. Tells him, get out from here. What have you done? Do you understand what you've done? You foolish boy. Because the narration mentions that Umar radiallahu anhu at this time is probably about 20, 26, 27 years old. Some narrations say 28. None of the narrations mention Umar radiallahu anhu being older than 28 years old. So he was young. So he says, do you realize what you've done? You foolish boy. Get out of here. When Umar radiallahu anhu leaves there, one of the narrations mentioned that he meets another man by the name of Jamil, who was one of the men of Quraysh. And he basically tells him that, I've accepted Islam. I've become a Muslim. And... When he finds out that Umar radiallahu anhu has accepted Islam, he basic Jamil bin Ma'mar. Jamil bin Ma'mar. He goes and goes around and starts telling everyone, Have you heard? Umar has accepted Islam. Have you heard? Umar has become a Muslim. Have you heard? Umar has joined Muhammad. He goes around telling everyone. So Abdullah bin Umar, 
radiyallahu anhu ma the son of umar ibn al-khattab abdullah he's he, some narrations actually mention that he had already accepted islam at this point but that goes back to the debate about how old he was and different things like that but nevertheless he at least mentions the fact that i was a boy wa ana ghulam aqil kull ma ra'aytu he says i was a boy at this time but i was i could recognize i could understand what was going on I was at least, you know, 8, 10, 12 years old. Like I could understand what was going on. So he says, I was with my father and we went to the haram. And Umar radiallahu anhu walked through the door of the haram and everybody there had already been whispering and gossiping about Umar radiallahu anhu becoming a Muslim. And he says, as soon as he walked through the door, everybody turned around and looked. Everyone turned around and looked. One of the narrations mentioned that that man, Jamil bin Ma'mar was actually there. So when Umar radiyallahu anhu walks in he goes hey hey everybody this is the guy I was telling you about Umar look he's left the religion as well and Umar radiyallahu anhu of course being uh you know the personality that he had Umar radiyallahu anhu says kadhiba he goes this man lies he says wala kinni qad aslamt because the word that the man used was he said qad sabaa he's a heretic he's for, he's given up his religion And Umar radiyallahu anhu says, "No, this man lies. Lakin ni qad aslamt. Rather, I've become a Muslim. Wa shahitu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. And I have given testimony to the fact that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. And the Muhammad is the slave and the messenger of Allah. Yeah, that's me. This was basically Umar radiyallahu anhu's version of saying, 'Come at me. Come on, come at me, bro. Bring it on.'" and what ends up happening the narration mentions that everybody started rushing up to Umar radiyallahu anhu and they say they mention the narration mentions that there were over a dozen people in the haram at that time and they all basically came at him and or, or some of the narrations mention that there were two three dozen people and it said that Umar radiyallahu anhu started fighting them it's like a strain a straight like a, a scene like out of the matrix You know when he's like fighting like all the hundreds of guys like there's literally like two dozen guys and Umar radiyallahu anhu is single-handedly fighting them. One of the narration mentions that they fought for an hour. Can you imagine what that must have been like? You ever watch a UFC fight? If you haven't don't. No khair. But if you have then you know what I'm talking about. UFC fights they fight for what? Three rounds? Five rounds? Some of them fight three rounds. Each round is 2 minutes. 3 minutes. They fight for a total of like 10 minutes. Have you seen what they look like afterwards? They're bloodied and bru- beaten and bruised. They look terrible. Can you imagine someone fighting like a dozen people for an hour? Subhanallah. This was the himma of Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu. He fought like a dozen men for like an hour just going at it non-stop. They kept they he kept pushing them back and throwing them down. They kept coming at him over and over again. and he fought literally like two dozen people for like an hour finally after an hour umar radiyallahu anhu backed away and the narration says abdullah bin umar his son who's watching all of this a little boy hiding back somewhere watching all of this he says finally my father stepped back and he sat down because he was tired <laughs> he was tired he sat down but he didn't give up there's a difference he sat down and he tells them do what you got to do y'all are free to do whatever it is that you want to do i i'm i'm done fight, trying to fight you guys off there's like three dozen of you it's one against 30 feel kind of sad for you guys but i i just you do what you have to do and some of the people who were there on that day they actually remembering this occasion they mention it's in the books of sirah that it wallahi if there were 300 of us He would have kept fighting each and every single one of us. Umar on that day, Umar already had a reputation. But Umar on that day seemed like he had no quit in him. It seemed like he just could not be defeated that day. No matter what, if there were 300 of us, he would have fought all 300. He just had something going on that day and that was the iman, the yaqeen that he felt in his heart. His heart was surging with the nur of iman and he just couldn't be stopped. So finally he sits down and he says you you do what you have to do. you want to kill me go ahead do whatever you can try your best And the narration says that an old man stood up 
very old man. إِذْ أَقْبَلَ شَيْخٌ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ عَلَيْهِ حُلَّةٌ حِبْرًا وَقَمِيسٌ مُوَشَّعٌ حَتَّى وَقَفَ عَلَيْهِمْ فَقَالَ مَا شَأْنُكُمْ So an old man stood up who was dressed like a very elderly, wise man, wearing like a robe and things like that. Like clothes that old, you know, wise men would wear, learned men. And he stood up and he said, what's going on with you guys? What are you guys doing here? And they said, Sabah Umar. This man Umar, he's left the religion. And so we're trying to teach him a lesson. Trying is the key operative word here. And he said, ma, ma. He said, leave him, leave him be. He said, رَجُلٌ اِخْتَارَ لِنَفْسِهِ أَمْرًا فَمَاذَا تُرِدُونَ He says, he's a man who's chosen a path for himself. What do you care? How does this concern you? Why do you care? فَمَاذَا تُرِدُونَ أَتَرَوْنَ بَنِي عَدِي يُسْلِمُونَ لَكُمْ صَاحِبَكُمْ هَكَذَا Do you really think that his family, and what he was saying was actually very intelligent, because who was more vile, who was more violent, Then Abu Jahl. But when Umar radiallahu anhu went to the house of Abu Jahl and said, I've accepted Muhammad's religion, what did Abu Jahl do? He cursed him and threw him out, but he didn't kill him. Because he was family. So the man, the old man says, do you really think that Banu Adi, the family of Umar is just gonna hand over one of their young, youngest and brightest? They're just gonna hand him over to you like that? It's a disrespect for the family. خَلُّوا عَنِ الرَّجُلِ Leave him alone. And Umar ibn Khattab, uh, excuse me, Abdullah bin Umar, the son says that literally, it was as if like somebody just pulled back the cloth. Because the crowd was converged around the Umar. It was like everybody just retreated back immediately. Everybody just walked away. And Umar, uh, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhumah says that, I asked my father quite a few years later, I remembered that. That was a memory I had, seeing all of that play out. And I asked my father, بَعْدَ أَنْ هَجَرَ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ I asked him after the hijrah to Medina. Years later, I asked my father, يَا أَبَتِي مَنِ الرَّجُلَ الَّذِي زَجَرَ الْقَوْمَ عَنْكَ بِمَكَّةِ يَوْمَ أَسْلَمْتَ وَهُمْ يُقَاتِلُونَكَ Who was the man who reprimanded the people and basically made everyone leave you alone the day they were trying to kill you, the day you accepted Islam? He said, ذَاكَ أَيْ بُنَيْ أَلْعَاصْ بِنْ وَائِلَ السَّحْمِ He says, oh my son, that man was Al-Aas bin Wa'il. So Umar radiallahu anhu never forgot the, the, you know, the wisdom that Aas bin Wa'il showed on that day. And so this was kind of the story of the conversion of Umar radiallahu anhu. And it's said in the narration that soon thereafter, Umar radiallahu anhu goes to the Prophet sallallahu and says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we need to go pray in the haram. We need a public like demonstration. We're here, we're not going nowhere. And now we got basically two guys to kind of lead the charge, to make it a strong impression, myself and Hamza. So we need to go out there. We need to march out into the public. We don't hide no more. And the Prophet ﷺ says, let's do it. And it says that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu relates the incident that they basically gathered up together. Hamza radiallahu anhu and Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu stood at the front and they basically marched out. And they walked from the house of Arqam into the Kaaba, into the Baytullah. And it said in the narration that Umar radiallahu anhu walked in first and basically made his intentions known. He said, everybody, I'm gonna pray here right now, okay? I'm gonna pray here right now. And I'm pretty sure nobody's gonna have a problem with that. And then everybody else walked in afterwards behind him. And they say that they stood up, they lined up. With again Umar radiallahu anhu and Hamza radiallahu anhu at both ends of the saf, and the Prophet sallallahu stood in front and he led them in prayer. And that was like the first public demonstration, major successful public demonstration that the, that the Muslims were able to make. And they were able to pl- pray publicly at the haram itself. And this was the first time. And this basically is what Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu refers to in the very famous narrations of Abdullah bin Mas'ud where he says, مَا كُنَّا نَقْدِرْ عَلَىٰ أَن نُصَلِّيَ عِنْدَ الْكَعْبَةِ حَتَّىٰ أَسْلَمَ عُمَرْ 
that we were not able to pray near the Kaaba until Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ عُمَرْ قَاتَلَ قُرَيْشِ حَتَّى صَلَّى عِنْدَ الْكَعْبَى وَصَلَّيْنَا مَعَهُ Then when Umar accepted Islam, he literally fought off the Quraysh at the Kaaba. That incident that we talked about. And then Umar prayed at the Kaaba and we prayed along with him. And in Sahih Bukhari is a famous narration, مَا زِلْنَا أَعِزَّةً مُنذُ أَسْلَمَ عُمْرُ الْخَطَّابِ that we have remained, um, you know, confident. We, re- we have been confident since the conversion of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And then of course, uh, other famous statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, where he says, Inna Islam Umar kana fathan. That the Islam of Umar, the conversion of Umar to Islam was a victory. وَإِنَّ هِجْرَتَهُ كَانَتْ نَصْرًا And his migration from Mecca to Medina, because he was one of the few people who openly, publicly migrated to Medina. Everybody else was slipping away in the middle of the night. Umar radiallahu anhu packed up his bags, went over to the Kaaba, prayed at the Kaaba, showed his bags to everyone and said, I'm going. If anyone has a problem, you can see me outside, but your wife will be a widow. And that's how he migrated. So he said that the migration of Umar radiallahu anhu was a victory. وَإِنَّ إِمَارَتَهُ كَانَتْ رَحْمَةً And his rulership over the Muslims, his leadership for the believers, his being the Khalifa, the Amir al-Mu'mineen, was a mercy. وَلَقَدْ كُنَّا وَمَا نُصَلِّي عِنْدَ الْكَعْبَ حَتَّى أَسْلَمَ عُمَرَ We were there and we were Muslim, but we could not pray near the Kaaba until Umar accepted Islam. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ عُمَرَ قَاتَلَ قُرَيْشًا حَتَّى صَلَّى عِنْدَ الْكَعْبَ وَصَلَّيْنَا مَعَهُ And then of course he says that Umar accepted Islam. And he fought off the Quraysh and he prayed near the Kaaba and all of us were able to pray with him near the Kaaba. So this is the story of Umar radiallahu anhu accepting Islam. But one of the things that I was saving here till the very end, that I found very, very interesting, almost uh, you know, remarkable, was that one of the early converts to Islam, um, she was known by the name of Umm Abdullah, um, but she was the mother of Abdullah bin Amir bin Rabi'a. His mother, Umm Abdullah, she was the daughter of, of Abu Hathma. She was an early convert to Islam. And it's mentioned in the narration that her and her son were amongst the people, were from the people who migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia, to Habasha, to East Africa. Her and her son. And she mentions a story, which shows you something very interesting. It shows you two things. Number one, it shows you about how Umar radiallahu anhu had some good inside of him. So when the Prophet ﷺ makes dua that oh Allah help Islam through Abu Jahl or Umar, why Allah chose Umar radiallahu anhu, you see some good inside of the man. But secondly, it also shows you how they perceived Umar radiallahu anhu and how their perception of Umar radiallahu anhu at the end of the day was irrelevant. How we perceive people socially is irrelevant. But it's how the standing or the position that someone has in the sight, in the eyes of Allah. You just never know the good that is in someone. So she mentions that we were packing up and basically trying to leave Makkah in order to go to Al-Habasha. إِنَّا لَنَتَرَحَلُوا إِلَىٰ أَرْضِ الْحَبَشَىٰ وَقَدْ ذَهَبَ عَامِرْ فِي بَعْضِ حَاجَتِنَا And my son Amir had gone to take care of, or actually it's her husband Amir. She says that my husband Amir had gone to go take care of a few things. إِذْ أَقْبَلَ عُمَرْ حَتَّى وَقَفَ عَلَيَّ وَهُوْ عَلَىٰ شِرْكِهِ Umar radiallahu anhu saw me standing outside the home with some bags, carrying some things. And he was still a mushrik, he was not Muslim yet. قَالَتْ وَكُنَّا نَلْقَى مِنْهُ بَلَاءً And Umar was trouble for us. As weak Muslims, Umar was trouble. When we saw Umar, we ran, we hid. Because he was one of the people who used to torture us. أَذَنْ لَنَا قَدْ أَذَّى لَنَا وَشَدَّ عَلَيْنَا She says that he used to harm us and he was very harsh on us. قَالَتْ فَقَالَ إِنَّهُ لِلْإِنْتِلَاقِ يَا أُمِّ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ When he saw her with some bags, he goes, are you planning to go somewhere? Oh, Umm Abdullah, are you planning to go somewhere? She said, Naam, we are, Wallahi lanakhru jannah, but this is also a woman who's a believer. So she feels courage 
And she says, Wallahi, lanakhrujanna fi ardillah. We are gonna go out into the earth of God. Adaytumuna wa qahartumuna. You people have harmed us, you people have done wrong to us. You oppress us. So yes, I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna go out into the land of Allah. The earth that is owned by God. Hatta yaja'al Allahu lana makhrajan. Until Allah will make a way for us and Allah will make a place for us. And then she says that Umar, he looks at me. I just made my intentions very clear. We're gonna go from here and go seek refuge somewhere. She says, Umar looks at me and he says to me, Sahibakumullah. May God be with you. May God be with you. And she says, وَرَأَيْتُ لَهُ رِقَّةً لَمْ أَكُنْ أَرَاهَا I saw some softness in Umar that I had never seen before. ثُمَّ صَرَفَ وَقَدْ أَحْزَنَهُ He turned around and walked away from there. And it seemed like he was sad. Because he was thinking to himself. فِيمَا أَرَى خُرُوجُ أَيْ خُرُوجُنَا that خُرُوجُنَا قَدْ أَحْزَنَهُ that he turned around from there and he seemed sad because of what he had done to us. He started to think, am I really this type of a person? Have I really made these people's lives so difficult, so terrible, that they have to run away from their homes? What have I done? What are you doing, Ya Umar? So he seems like he had a moment to self-reflection. And then she says that, my husband came back, and I said, Ya Aba Abdullah, لَوْ رَأَيْتَ عُمَرْ آنِفًا وَرِقَّتَهُ وَحُزْنَهُ عَلَيْنَا She says that, man, you missed it. You will not believe what just happened. Umar came here. And then she told him the whole story. And then he asked her the question. This also tells you about those early believers. They were all da'is. They were all du'at ila Allah. They were all callers to Allah. She, he asks his wife, أَطَمِعَتِ فِي إِسْلَامِهِ were you hopeful of him accepting Islam? And she says, yeah, I was. But then she says, that her husband says to her, لا يسلم الذي رأيتي لا يسلم الذي رأيتي This man that you saw today, Umar, I know Umar, I know Umar. Don't worry, he's not going to accept Islam حتى يسلم حمار الخطاب the donkey of Khattab will accept Islam before the son of Khattab will accept Islam. Alright? I understand he might have had a moment of reflection or something like that, but don't worry. Woman, alright, let me tell you. Listen woman, that's, that's the problem with you women. You get all caught up in the moment. Don't get too excited, don't get too happy, alright? The donkey of Khattab will accept Islam before the son of Khattab will accept Islam. And she says, that my husband wasn't very hopeful in his in Islam. لِمَا كَانَ يَرَى مِنْ غِلْزَتِهِ وَقِسْوَتِهِ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ Because of how harsh he was against Islam and the Muslims. But what's very interesting here, like I pointed out before I started the story, you see some good inside, deep buried inside. Maybe it was the alcohol that had been covering it for so long. But you see some goodness that was buried inside of Umar radiallahu anhu that showed at this moment. And without a doubt, this is the reason why he was, he was the one for whom the dua of the Prophet ﷺ was accepted. But secondly, even though this is also Sahabi, Amir radiallahu anhu, and we make no judgment about Sahabi, but I'm talking about public perception. Look how they perceived Umar radiallahu anhu. He says, a donkey will accept Islam before Umar does. I mean, what was their perception of Umar radiallahu anhu? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how shocked this man must have felt 20 years after he made that comment? When Umar radiallahu anhu is Amirul Mu'mineen Khalifa. Can you imagine the shock? He probably used to sit there and think and look and just be like, man, who would have... Nobody saw this coming. Nobody could have predicted this. Nobody could have predicted this. As is obvious from the statement. But it goes to show you that it don't matter what we think about anybody. Because we project our own weaknesses upon other people. We project the evil in our own hearts upon other people. We have biases and prejudices that we project onto people. It don't matter what we think about people. It don't matter how we perceive people. All that matters is their position in the eyes and the sight of Allah. 
And you just never know what someone's capable of. You never know the goodness that somebody has. You never know the greatness that someone is destined for. And that's exactly why we don't judge people. We don't underestimate people. We value people. It, what, well, somebody says, well, what if they're, they're, he's a bad person, he's a terrible person? Well, we're supposed to go around just expecting good from every... Yeah, absolutely. If they turn out to be bad, then so be it. I didn't lose anything. It's them who lost something. But if they turn out to be good, then at least I did not underestimate someone. And maybe, just maybe, I could have been the one to even facilitate. I could have been chosen by Allah as the sabab, as the facilitator of the good within that person. Imagine what the reward of that is. Even imagine what the reward of that is. So the story of Umar radiallahu anhu is very profound from the power of the Qur'an. And this is why we all need to read the book of Allah and reflect on the book of Allah. That was that moment that changed Umar's life. From the importance of having the reading and the learning and the teaching and the discussion of the Qur'an within our homes. It's going, it, unfortunately today the tragedy is it doesn't even go on within all the houses of Allah. We don't even have proper halaqat of the Qur'an going on in all the masajid today. When in reality the standard is, forget about masajid, masajid is a no-brainer. It's supposed to be going on within each and every single home. Every home is meant to be a madrasa and a school of the Qur'an. And we have to revive that sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. And we could have umrs waiting on our doorsteps today as well. Number three, we see that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu had some goodness within him. Always look for the good within people. And no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on in your life, always try to focus on something good. And it might be one little good thing that you're holding on to, but that one good thing is your, is your lifeline. That what's, that's what might end up saving you. And then fourthly and finally, never look down on anyone. Never underestimate anyone. It's the greatest mistake you can make. Because you never know what somebody's capable of. You never know the greatness that someone is destined for. And we hope and we pray that if it, even if it's not us who are going to do great things, at the very least we can facilitate. We can be the means of someone coming to Islam and finding their destiny of doing great things. Bidnillahi ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa hamdihi. Subhanakallahu wa hamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfirka wa natubu ilayk.